Thanks everybody for coming along tonight. It's really good to see people in space. It's still some places a bit tentative about being in a lecture theatre together, so much appreciated. Um, and thank you for this chance to talk to you all today. I know Rory in the poster, he positioned our, our practice, as just mentioned about the spaces left behind, all their relationships to other spaces, less so what you look at directly. And I think you said space, no, I always get this wrong, space not shape, that's right. Um, and I thought that actually made me think that a talk I gave last month in Switzerland entitled On Comfort was actually really appropriate because comfort is a condition rather than a thing or an object. So it sort of made sense within this. Having said that, I feel slightly sheepish because I am notorious for rewriting just about every talk I do for the specific invitation. It, it just always seems to need some tweaking. So minor tweakings, but um, it's a little bit of a repeat, if that makes sense, anyway. And it was a perfect time slot as well. So this is, um, this came from a symposium last month that Paolo Tombesi from, previously from University of Melbourne had run at EPFL. Um, and it was entitled Affirming Actions. And interestingly about models of architectural agency. Importantly, there was 15 speakers and um, from architects all around the world. And what was significant about this was that there were innovative professional practices established and led by women. Um, the point foregrounding the work and um, as central. So you can see some of those names and I strongly urge you to have a look at some of those people's work. It's just astonishing. So there was uh, about six or seven different panels and we were paired and the one I was given was to talk about on comfort. So it was really interesting for me to speculate, um, you know, what do we mean by the term comfort? Uh, what do I make of this key preoccupation, especially in the context of our practice and I think of pertinence today in Rory's framing? Uh, I wanted to start with this quote from Daniel Barber and his thinking about comfort, which highlights the impact um, our practices to achieve comfort have contributed to climate change. So this great irony of architecture. And his challenge for us to rethink comfort towards a more sustainable, less resource intense practice of architecture. In particular, I like his definition of comfort as a term to describe consistency, normalcy and predictability. Um, and significantly, to utilise discomfort as a value for spatial innovation. So I sort of hold, hold that thought. Um, so there's three things I wanted to think about in relation to comfort today. Comfort is often something we experience. It's something we feel, whether in passing or lingering. It can be all encompassing. We can be immersed in it to a point of not noticing because we are comfortable, in which case we might take it for granted or if we are uncomfortable, by contrast, we may be profoundly aware of it to the point of being stirred into action to remove the source of the discomfort. So it was for me with aspects of architectural practice that I found uncomfortable. I established my own practice in 1984 because I was uncomfortable with some of the defaults of conventional architectural practice. I was uncomfortable with the kinds of work women architects were relegated to. I was uncomfortable with oppositions that structured our thinking and resultant buildings. I was uncomfortable with the split between person and practice mode. Uncomfortable with some of the myths around the kind of behaviour and style of leadership, arrogant, uncompromising, epitomised, I'm sure you all know the film The Fountainhead, by a style of the, a certain type of leadership as causative of architectural excellence amongst celebrated figures. Um, and uncomfortable with common practice that high quality design practice was necessarily subsidised by low paid workers and or parallel academic positions, for instance. And I have always maintained teaching parallel to practice, but cautioned against using it to run the practice, which takes your foot off the pedal with making it a viable business. So 
that's for a whole other discussion. So KTA sought to affirm a different approach and to give form to an alternate model of leadership to address, a, to address a key gap in the provision of design service that counters these myths just described. And in the light of yesterday's uh, announcement about the medal, this seemed particularly uh, pertinent. When I started my practice, I had no particular plan, but I did have a hunch that architectural practice could rethink some of those, some of those myths. So, um, we, some of the things we did early on um, to avoid that discomfort of where we might be pigeonholed, especially as a, a, a practice led by women, was to challenge some of the expectations about the sorts of projects we do. And that's why things like very early on, sound walls for Vic Roads were really important, um, dealing with infrastructure at the scale of the highway. And similarly, um, our police stations um, with uh, Victoria Police, those sort of small civic projects. So some of our key or core tenets for KTA's approach, our affirming actions for practice are, one, that design quality and business acumen are not mutually exclusive, two, that a rigorous design culture can also be a supportive workplace culture, and that an architect can show strength and sensitivity, clarity of leadership and listening. Um, and I do think the way we do architecture as business and process should be as of good a quality as the much applauded or awarded and enjoyed output our buildings. So by linking design and business as mutually supportive endeavours, we aim to put the right conditions in place for delivery of exemplars within relatively normal hours and within a financially sustainable model. So, and I think that's where I, um, this is a, um, a um, diagram from Parla. It's really interesting tracking um, all of the research around um, practice conditions. And I think it's sort of bizarre that we've seen this correlation between the health of a workplace, its thriving people and business is what enables architecture excellence. But it's ironic that in achieving built comfort for our clients, we have as an industry become habituated to experiencing personal discomfort in terms of work practices to achieve this. So hence that um, interesting graph from Parla, um, which has done so much to analyse and advocate around industry issues. So um, the only other thing just to touch on this first thinking around comfort or discomfort is on design leadership, a type of um, a way of thinking about, I often talk about architecture as having to necessarily resolve all of the differences, the tensions in the various parties and considerations that goes into or makes up the process of making buildings. And that a way of thinking about that is accommodating. Now, sometimes we accommodating in the past is seen as um, something that people do to sort of just put up with things rather than it being more generative. And we've been interested to try and use it in a more positive or generative sense to take the contingencies of a project, time, budget, site, and so on, all the um, interests of a par the parties and develop those into a rigorous exercise of um, hierarchies and needs and also to constantly remain alert and open to the input of others um, at all stages of a project to work productively with them. Um, and this, I think, is the circumstances of architecting. And importantly, that when it's underpinned by intent, it's also to prioritise, filter, distill and refine. So some of the studio teaching I've done has used those ideas around especially contingency and negotiating between participants as really good sort of starting points for people going into future practice as necessarily collaborative, integrated and negotiated. So the flocking of birds comes to mind. We've been doing a lot of discussions around these um, in the office as a way to try and describe that the design process is not necessarily linear. It's like this multiplicity of bodies sometimes going in entirely divergent directions. And it's how you get this jet, jet gradual alignment towards the right spatial model for the set of circumstances of a project. Okay, and I think that point of accommodating is a really um, lovely challenge to a more constructive alternative to the much derided practice or mythologised heroic figure of the 20th century architect as somehow sort of bullish, resolute and didactic, and dare I say it was likely male, um, as unyielding in the face of all these other people's considerations. 
Okay, so a lot about clarity of intent. Um, and now I want to show you two projects that explicitly wrestle with comfort in alternate ways. And um, also uh, both public projects, conventional in terms of their regulatory and procurement context. So the first one I'm going to start with is the Melbourne Holocaust Museum. And this was completed last year. It's with education programs and museum spaces are going to be open in June, but it's already running its education programs. Um, in a recent uh, discussion, moderated by Andros Sanso on future museums between Liz Diller, Paola Cardoso and myself, Liz made the observation that museums have an imperative to confront us with difficult ideas, to make us uncomfortable that the museum is a site for encountering discomfort. And while I agree that their role is often to challenge, I distinguish between the museum content rather than the museum architecture as a means of creating an encounter of discomfort. Architecture's role in a museum about the Holocaust is fraught. Many overseas examples have attempted to use architecture to somehow render the horrors of the Holocaust in either associative ways, for instance, the Washington Museum, which you can see on the right, imitates aspects of Auschwitz. Um, or in Lieberskin's deployment of the bunker, albeit for a profound experiential purpose and effect. Um, yet for us, um, and for many, the Holocaust remains outside of representation. So we began this project by asking what is the role of architecture within the Museum of the Holocaust? And related to this, what is the role of architecture with profound cu cultural discomfort as its subject? The Melbourne Holocaust Museum is a significant cultural repository. Our position is that its programs, content and the stories of survivors and their families rather than the architecture a best place to attempt to speak of the unspeakable. They are the means of discomfort. Um, in the museum's prior incarnation pictured here, it also adopted a foreboding language, particularly the entry experience, which passed through a, um, a work of Andrew Rogers. So what role its new architecture? The new works are abstract rather than associative, but also humane and they attempt to overcome threshold fear, which was a key consideration in the new design. So rather than appear as a very closed bunker, which is a very common trope in Holocaust museums, the Melbourne Holocaust Museum is visually more transparent and physically connected to the community and street through its facade and through its interior present as a community facility to be shared and experienced. It also reinforces the museum's role as a cultural repository by integrating the original heritage building, literally embedding it within the new fabric and treating it as an important artifact of the museum's genesis. The museum's purpose is threefold, education, research and remembrance to keep the voices of Holocaust survivors alive through education and memorialization. And the program is arranged around a luminous central circulation spine over five levels that ensure all these purposes are legible to visitors. Light was a central driver for the architecture of the museum. Light is linked to illumination, illumination to knowledge, and given that education is central to the purpose of the museum, then it seemed appropriate to deploy light as a motive in creating welcoming and functional spaces. Internal spaces are reserved and luminous. And the architecture is deliberately comfortable, humane and gentle in its disposition as a device for fostering an emotional openness to the discomfort of the, of the content and in order to impart very difficult learnings. A survivor visiting upon completion said she felt a great sense of calm from the architecture, which I think was of, um, felt, she felt was very respectful for what the program was. The use of a mainly timber interior palette, especially for touch points, is towards a kinesthetic empathy, a, a feeling of bodily comfort and warmth, rather than the, the hurt that might otherwise be imagined um, through um, some of the, the content. And the sculpture previously at the entry is now in a memorial garden to the western end of the entry foyer, um, with the, um, the memorial flame at the end of that space. So the sort of key um, interiors always giving you relief and 
uh, ability to look to outside and to light. The facade utilises glass bricks to achieve transparency while balancing the security demands for a resilient building envelope. Some early sketches. And it's variegated through a combination of clay and solid glass bricks. Ingredients calibrated according to light sensitivity and the nature of internal activities and spaces enclosed behind. Views into and out of the building are enabled to and from less light sensitive zones such as administration and classrooms and withheld from museum and archive spaces. Light and views out both east and west increase as one moves upwards. So the visually most open parts formed by glass bricks and hit and miss formation are adjacent to the elevated memorial garden and central public circulation spine that encompasses the stairs and breakout areas to provide some relief for visitors more strongly affected by the difficult museum content. They also provide a hint of the surrounding suburban context, which you can see in the distance. This is a way of connecting from within the museum to the local context, which is particularly important. Um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. I will just say too, um, it's interesting how some of our public projects or larger projects have um, learnt from smaller projects we might have done over the years. So this is from a house we did about eight or nine years ago. The first time we incorporated glass shards into a facade, a brickwork facade. So it's interesting how that was an early test case for what we did in the museum. Mirrors, skylights and windows capture and or reflect back sky, clouds and nearby rooftops of suburban Melbourne. And this is ways to use the architecture to help locate visitors um, back into their local context as a way of coming back from some of the trauma landscapes that people will visit through the museum. So these are some in the section you can see. Um, also, it's a very, very compressed moon. There's a lot of program in a very tight envelope. And so this was also ways through these light scoops with mirrors to open up that fairly compressed space and again reconnect people to, um, to the sky and local context especially the sky and indexing of time. Um, for survivors, views of the skies were extremely important and sustaining. So that became also a key motive that you can see here. Um, mirrors also at the entries to the museum spaces um, for comfort and discomfort. They're a prompt for visitors to reflect on their own responsibilities, but also a reminder of personhood lost which we can see in these. Um, into the museum space is still pending fit out, but the beginnings, this is um, part of the memorial space that Stephen Jolson has designed that's still under construction. Um, within that, he has uh, introduced this Star of David into a, um, a light shaft, which is a continuation of the original heritage turret on the corner of the building dragging that view of sky down to there and which from outside you can see is finished with these uh, glass bricks to also operate as something of a beacon in, in the neighbourhood. Um, the library and the research area are on the street uh, and we felt that the library and research was especially an important part of the purpose of the museum to impart knowledge as a way of um, especially enabling understanding and felt like an appropriate thing to have on the street as a point of connection where previously they had been closed, closed doors. So um, again, the facade opening to outside. Gardens throughout a really useful way to register seasonal change. The hopefulness of the trees in spring lends a very different character to winter when their dormancy is more ominous. Um, a series of memorial spaces, both inside and within the light shaft that you saw for collection, uh, for individual reflection. This question of glass bricks and why, um, it was a way to achieve um, resilience. I think I talked about that before, um, but it also is a sort of um, a link to what it means to be in a situation where um, the glass shop front that at the time of Kristallnacht, which was seen as the beginning of the Holocaust, where that fragility um, of certain groups under threat um, was not, not what is here. And so this possibility of having more openness and glass. 
So this is a way to register that relative freedom, and I say relative, um, to express different cultural identities in Melbourne in 2023 while balancing those demands for a resilient building envelope. So the architecture of the museum, just to finish up on this, is brings about um, around the Holocaust, explicitly brings together, often through gradients and spectrums, what are usually uncomfortably opposite conditions or uncomfortable tensions between delicacy and monumentality, gentleness and strength, brutality and beauty, and heritage with new architectures. Also grief and hope and death and life. Visiting a Holocaust museum is challenging, knowing the dark subject matter one will confront. It will be uncomfortable. And as Jane Josem, the director, has described the building's design as a humane and sensitive, sensitive response, which creates a nurturing environment where difficult knowledge can be safely imparted. School students are educated in this uplifting setting with multiple areas for reflection on the lessons. Um, and as she has also said, it's, um, it's as a humane space, it facilitates their important storytelling and knowledge sharing. So knowledge and understanding of cultural trauma, profoundly uncomfortable discomfort, is enabled to be accessed by an architecture of gentleness and comfort. The second project is the Bundanon Art Museum and Bridge. And this is on the land of the Yuan people. In Darawal language, Bundanon means deep valley. First, some climatic context. In 2019 to 2020, Australia's east coast experienced bushfires of unprecedented intensity. And at the time, Bundanon's art collection, um, was, which previously in a container, was rushed off the site um, because of the threat it was under. Then, of course, in 2022, there were three major flooding events. So, um, while the intensity of these extreme events was increasing and the interval between them reducing with climate change, inundation and fires have always been part of Australia's landscapes and they are part of this land's flows. For the traditional custodians, the Wadi Wadi and Yuan people here on this east coast for over 8,000 years, care for country entails not impeding these flows. So our challenge was to stop using architecture against them. Towards this, the museum and bridge directly engages with the barber challenge to deploy climate discomfort for spatial innovation. It's a centre for arts and education and Australia's only national museum in a regional setting about two and a half hours south of Sydney. And it's driven by themes of climate resilience. It asks if comfort for the land, for country, may assume discomfort for people. Variations in climate, some discomfort, are central to the visitor experience and they're harnessed as opportunities for delight and connection with place through a responsive and sustainable infrastructure with the site's ecology at its heart. <coughs> uh, it was established in 99 by preeminent Australian painter Arthur Boyd and his family and its purpose was to foster an appreciation for and an understanding of art and environment. It's a whole of site public museum that researches, collects, conserves, interprets, and exhibits tangible and intangible heritage. This extends to the site's biodiversity, its flora and fauna. And while the architecture is influenced by Boyd's pictorial frames of the landscape, um, that might be the things that we look at, uh, more significantly, his practice of painting en plein air immersed in and exposed to the vicissitudes of climate inspired our approach to use architecture to feel climate as a way to connect with place. So a more climate immersive approach required transdisciplinary thinking between architecture, landscape, ecology, structures and environmental design. And here's our core team, a couple of call outs, rate associates, um, fabulous uh, landscape architects from New Zealand, Atelier 10, who did the ESD with us, Irwin Consulting. Um, in particular, though, that core were working with us on the, the master plan, absolutely together from the beginning. And it, it, importantly, it required us to shift from a picturesque to a more ecological and performative landscape that extends well beyond site boundaries to account for its flows over vast, regional catchment areas to the Shoalhaven River. 
The landscape works also extend before the, beyond the more obvious visual features, such as ramps, gardens and new event spaces. They also include landscape management plan, which takes account of vegetation communities and the repair of these, especially to the wet gullies and riparian zones. This supports the biodiversity initiatives of the Trust as a wildlife sanctuary too, which also has alliances with research such as breeding programs, um, including, for instance, the reintroduction of the stuttering frog and, of course, wombats, which are now absolutely flourishing. <coughs> so care for country also means or requires repair and regeneration works, not just the sort of new buildings that are obviously introduced. <coughs> Excuse me, and these were prepared by rate um, landscape architects. So going back to that comment I made about design intent, and I think as um, thesis students, this is a really, really important part of what uh, we're all struggling to do, and that is to find a, a, a sort of organising devices for your work. In this project, the relationship between buildings and the ground was key. We established a clear design intent to structure this, a spectrum from bunker to bridge. This yielded an array of spatial types and climatic conditions that aligned function and user comfort with the site's climatic, ecological and topographic conditions for reduced mechanical systems. Within this, architecture operates as infrastructure at the scale of the extended landscape system and its flows. There are two key architectural elements, a fire resistant museum and a flood resilient bridge for creative learning. The art museum is fire resistant and embedded in the hill. The bridge forms a creative learning centre and visitor accommodation. It's flood resilient and straddles the wet gully. A spectrum from being in the ground through to suspended above it corresponds with the spectrum of climate modification relative to program, from being in a highly controlled interior environment to being on plein air. And climate modification relative to program needs and benchmarks of people's visual and thermal comfort. So if you like, this is a sort of spectrum of comfort as well. The subterranean museum is thermally stable and that's to minimise the technology demands to protect the artworks and so on. And the bridge, by contrast, is thermally variable. Um, it's naturally ventilated and very porous. New buildings are carefully sited between lines of fire and flood, claiming airspace over the gully. So the red line is the line of fire. We had to sort of keep set back from that. And then the blue line is the predicted maximum flood level. As soon as you say that, you know it could probably be exceeded, but such is the nature of flood modelling these days. So the fire resistant art museum, it's highly insulated subterranean structure with an earth roof buried into the hillside and a single concrete facade with minimal openings, reducing exposure to weather fluctuations and fire risk. Programs requiring clo close control conditioning to preserve and display artifacts are located deepest in this resilient bunker, buffered by and tempered front of house and administrative spaces that open to the forecourt. The flood resilient bridge is instead unconditioned, open air, passive, um, and spanning above the probable maximum flood level. It's for short-term accommodation, workshops, dining and kitchen, and the spaces are arranged along the naturally ventilated bridge with breezeways to take advantage of mild climate and local wind effects for cooling. So these two approaches enable the substantially passive performance of both buildings by virtue of their siting, materiality and typology but they also, also offer a profound contrast in visitor experience of place and implications for comfort. The interplay between museum and bridge through bushfire resistant windows um, and sliding panels that can shut out natural light in the gallery. The museum is stereotomic architecture. It's embedded, monolithic, concrete, massive, a refuge. From below its sloping roof, we sense the weight of the earth and the hill above, its stable, cool and mass. And the artworks are protected and we're comf relatively comfortable in a stable interior environment. <clears throat> By contrast, on the bridge, it's tectonic. It's assembled from many pieces of steel. And I know someone's going to ask me about steel in a minute, so hold that question. Um, it supports the land's comfort by allowing overland flow and sporadic floodwaters in the wet gully below it, with its stilts posing minimal hydraulic impact. 
um, it tends towards the aerial and dramatically suspending visitors above the gully, a counterpoint to the grounding of the subterranean museum. This is one on one of the multi-purpose breezeways here where one is immersed in climate, whether hot or cold, so you're very exposed to the extremes. And there's something about the thrill of occupying such a structure like a trestle bridge, which offers both prospect and refuge. Part of this connection to place is through feeling climate, and yes, sometimes to the point of discomfort. In workplace design, there's increasing attention to the correlation between comfort of environment and our health and well-being. But the foregrounding of our experience of climate, the visceral embodied feeling of environmental conditions remains somewhat limited and under-celebrated for a narrative around ways to genuinely engage with place. So the climate on a given day and in a particular place, while part of a global system, of course, is felt in its local specificity. It's the medium we as humans occupy alongside other living creatures. It's our habitat. So recalling the spectrum, captured in an earlier slide, the project uses architecture to orchestrate an array of relationships between ourselves and the climate of Bundanon through spectrums of interiority, climate modification, orientation to ground, and yes, degrees of comfort. Noting that comfort is relative. Through feeling climate, our awareness of the particular and changing qualities of a specific place are heightened. Um, this is also a sort of um, image, I think, which holds that sense of gradients I spoke about before too, and um, uh, in the way that the structure like the bridge plays hide and seek between forest and artifact and the sort of confounds opposites in that sort of gentle strength and um, interplay of being very recessive and at other times quite evident. These different relationships between our bodies and climate also enable an array of multisensorial experiences. The sound of wind or stillness, the sound of animals rustling, there's just so much going on at night there, which you can really hear when you stay. The feeding, um, bird songs, frog calls, smells of seasonal variation, um, flowering plants, earth, composting, leaves, and so on. Um, and the feeling of cooling breezes, uh, the river, the smells of salt, it all orientates us to a direction of the country's flow. Uh, another one of the spaces, a creative learning space for art classes, workshops, workshops, dining, and so on. Other things like the sound of rain on an unlined metal parasol roof, um, and post rain, the smell of wet timber down the corridor, the black timbers, which recall something of the forest post fire. Room entries, feelings of intimacy, the smell of local timber, spotted gum, radial cut for less wastage, the rhythmic sound of footsteps on the timber deck. What is deemed an acceptable level of comfort is inherently influenced by the cultural context. At our encouragement, the client accepted an alternate level of comfort from that usually associated with, and we had to tell them this was not a conventional hotel in Australia, but so no air conditioning and the rooms rely entirely on natural ventilation and a fan. And in fact, supporting that is things like Bundanon's communications, which we wrote to set some of those expectations accordingly for less comfort, more discomfort. A little bit of a battle around that. Individuals are invited to tune their environment. There's things like low-tech systems like hand-operated screens and louvers which invite users to do their bit, to tune their room according to their preference for more or less light, air, sound and so on. And it's also a way to connect with place. The perforated sliding screens deals with um, flies, fire ember attack and also sunlight. So Bundanon invites visitors to notice their expectations of comfort and adapt their behaviour accordingly. These operable elements offer a gentle way to engage visitors with how buildings can adapt to climate variation and empower users to be instrumental to a space's climatic performance towards their ideals of comfort. So you can find your spot according to the climate the modulation of sunlight, shadow casts some relief from blistering heat at times. The touch of your hand, the coolth or warmth of a concrete seat. 
and these sorts of outdoor classrooms which are sort of happening under that uh, by appropriating that space below the belly of the bridge um, undercover but immersed their degrees of comfort that's different activities so just to sort of start finishing up the project required and demonstrates an important conceptual shift for architecture from isolated artifact to part of an integrated system encompassing ecology landscape infrastructure and architecture from a pictorial to a performative landscape in which the flow of water especially is supported by architecture for climate adaptation in combination with ongoing cultural practices and land management that's undertaken by Bundanon, especially with the fire sticks which is run by um, local peoples and this unimpeded overland flow of gully below the bridge. Um, you can see uh, sort of all the PVs on the roof um, and other sort of elements integrated for the importance of impact through applying passive design principles supported by appropriate technologies. Also by broadening our band of acceptable personal discomfort, this design for resilient structures enables care for country, comfort for the land in allowing its flows to continue. Comfort, it seems, is always relative and it is understood according to spectrums, a state of being more or less. Using clear design intents, both projects apply a spectrum to navigate degrees of climatic or cultural comfort and in turn utilise tectonics to happily confound oppositional thinking, affirming the possibility of both and all and everything in between. Thank you.